Welcome to part three of our series on Gregorian Chant for Beginners. Well, before we go on and talk anymore, we should sing something. So I'm going to include a chant here that you can sing with me. It's, it's pretty familiar to a lot of people, even if they've never seen the music for it. And so I thought this might be a good one to start with. And I'm going to sing the first part, the Kyrie eleison. I'm going to sing that, and we're going to repeat it. Then I'm going to sing the Christe eleison. We're going to repeat that. Then I'll sing Kyrie eleison, and then the Kyrie eleison printed after that. And then we'll end. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. Christe Let's sing that last one again. Congratulations! You've just sung a piece of real Gregorian chant, and you don't even know what you're doing, maybe, or looking at. That wasn't so bad. Hey, so this just proves chant is for everyone. Pretty soon you're going to know all those notes, what they're called, how to read the um, key signatures and, and rhythmic markings and all this stuff. It's all going to make sense. It won't be Greek anymore to you, ha uh -uh, except the text, which is Greek and always will be. Kyrie eleison means Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. It's the only Greek that we still have regularly as part of the Roman Rite liturgy, which is kind of cool. So anyway... Uh, we'll get back to a little bit of our talk about the history of Gregorian chant and getting you all kind of oriented to where it came from. And then we'll dig into reading the music. An excerpt from the preface to one of the official liturgical books of the church, the 1908 edition of the Graduale Romanum, says, quote, The above rules regarding the execution of the Gregorian melodies have been drawn from the Holy Fathers, some of whom learnt this way of singing from the angels, while others received it from the teaching of the Holy Spirit, speaking to their hearts in contemplation. If we set ourselves to practice these principles with diligence, we too shall appreciate the subtle charm of the chant, singing to God in our heart and spirit and mind. Unquote. That's quite a claim. So what are we talking about here? What is Gregorian chant and where did it come from? The Jews, since before the time of Christ, chanted the Psalms as part of their prayer, and these melodies in the scriptural texts have been incorporated into the sacred musical treasury of the church and formed the basis for what the early Christians sang to worship God. St. Ambrose of Milan in the 4th century, after the legalization of Christianity, took upon himself a great part of the task of refining and reforming the chants then in use, making them more fit for Christian worship, which was called for by the bishops of the Catholic world, and the style of chant you still bump into today is named after him, Ambrosian Chant. New chants were composed, and the tradition grew. Then Pope St. Gregory the Great came along in the 6th century and decided that the music needed to be codified and carefully taught, and so it was gathered together eventually in written form, the first sheet music, and preserved greatly from then on, though the chants we sing today bear the marks of several influences from the past, which include that of Jewish solo psalmody, the monastic tradition that developed for singing the Divine Office, and popular elements of various kinds, such as you'll observe in centuries-old hymns that have come down to us. So Gregory's name is where the term Gregorian comes from, and this treasury of living history, which we have today, thanks to him, has been the official music of the Roman Catholic Church since the 11 and 1200s. A monk named Guido in the 1100s is the one who first invented the system of notation, which we still use for writing and reading Gregorian chant. 
It's the oldest notation out there, these square notes that we've just seen. And chant truly is the granddaddy of all modern music because modern notation came from Gregorian notation and chant has been the music of the people since before the time of Christ, as we have seen. So a note about the notation that I have here. Some chants have been put to modern notation because that's what people are now used to seeing when they go to sing. But if you sing only from modern notes, then most of the treasury of chant will be off limits to you because it hasn't been or just plain can't really be rendered into modern notation. As you sing more chant from the square notes, you will notice a certain rise and fall, a life and breath to the music that does not come across easily without them. Give it a year of singing square notes, then try to sing a chant out of a hymnal under round notes, equal distances apart, bound by a time signature or not, and you will see what I mean. It constricts the performance of it and takes away the freedom and expression that the Gregorian notation so easily supplies to those melodies. Gregorian notation is actually easier to read than modern, believe it or not. So if you don't know how to read modern music, you don't need to worry. I learned to sight read modern notation because I first learned to sight read chant. Otherwise, I don't know how I ever would have figured it out. And I still struggle with sight reading modern notation. Why? Because of the key signatures and all those pesky sharps and flats. That's not really a thing in chant. There's one flat that you can have, and that's it. And I also said this before, but for you music readers out there, the reason chant has only four lines in the notation instead of the five we're used to seeing is because chant is for the voice, and the typical vocal range doesn't extend past what four lines of music can contain. Also, because chant is for the voice, that means that it's not set in any specific key. It's made to be movable for the comfort of those singing it so that it's workable, which is really cool, but it kind of throws some people who have studied modern music theory because they're used to just looking at the key signature of the sheet music they're working with and following it. Because if you decide to try and, and change the key you're singing in or playing in, it gets really complicated. So they're like, whoa, whoa, wait, that's not right. How can you do that? How can that music stay truly what it's supposed to be if you're just moving it all over the place? But it really does work, and that's the next thing I'm going to talk to you about. We're going to talk about scales and starting to look at the music and understand the basics of how to figure out the melody and how to set it where you need it to be for singing it.